Who? Micha. Are you here? Are you here? Okay. Uh, were you here last week? You were here? Yeah. No. Okay. okay. And what about? I don't know the program. Oh, you know the program. Oh, okay. Okay. So what I have prepared today actually was planning to continue last week's class on trusting in God. What is the definition of putting your trust? But before we get to the subject of bitachon, which means to trust, first of all, on the board over there, I want to just mention something. Today is the passing of the Alter Rebbe, Pope Dalatavis. The Alter Rebbe's name was Shnei Or, Two Lights, because he was a beacon of light in the uh, revealed part of Torah, you wrote Shulchan Aruch, Code of Jewish Law, written by the Alter Rebbe. And then we also have the Tanya and Hasidus. He was the first of the Chabad dynasty. So he was uh, someone who radiated two lights. Interesting. Take the word Vo'era, which is the name of this week's Parsha. What do you get in Vo'era? Put the Al before the Vav, and you have a race, you get Or. Then you have another aleph, which is the abbreviation of the word R, meaning it's a short form of the word R. So we have, you get it? We have two R. We have aleph, vav, resh, that's R. And then we have another aleph, which is the first letter of the word R. So together we have two levels of light. One of them is spelled out for us. That's the revealed part where the letters are spelled out. Then we have the letter Aleph, but you don't see the whole word. That shows that it's referring to the uh, esoteric, the concealed part of Torah, which is Chassidus. So in the very name of this week's parsha, Vo'era, you have a hint to the Alter Rebbe, whose name was Shneor. Okay. What I wanted to share with you was a... Um, something fascinating, but I, I try to do it every single year, but it never works out. Let me just first give out the Sikha. Sikha, we, we did last week, we didn't finish it. Then we have something else that I'm not going to give out yet. This is what we call 10 plague therapy. It's written by my brother, older brother. And he connects the 10 plagues with 10 steps in how we can gain our therapy to be able to be receptive to the 10 commandments, the Aseras Adibros. And we all know that we have 10 faculties, learning Hanya, you know, we have three intellectual faculties, Chabad, seven emotional faculties. So there's 10 parts to our personality, but it has to be in sync with the Torah which is composed of 10 commandments. Because at that time, there were 10 commandments given to us. So for our life to be aligned with the holiness of the Torah, which is gonna be given to us, and for us to go out of all our constraints, going out of Egypt, not just geographically, but also uh, metaphorically, to go out of all our limits. The word Mitzrayim means Mitzar, anguish limits, constraints, impediments, obstacles that suffocate a Jew spiritually. We were not a nation. In Mitzrayim, we were like a nation inside of a nation. We couldn't, we had no independence, not just independence in terms of what we can do in the, in the physical realm, but our souls were also locked. We couldn't express even what we call the Pintaliyid, the essence of a Jew, which is so special. Even that was locked and it couldn't be revealed. So as a result, we needed not just Paro and the Egyptians needed, but the Jews needed to teach, be taught a lesson, a 10 prong, 10 fold lesson, how to get closer to the Torah giving, how to get out of our limits. So let me just give you a little bit of introduction here. 
I'm going to spend a few minutes on this, maybe a little more than a few minutes before we get to the Sikha. And later on, I'll give it, I don't have that many, but we have uh, about six copies. So they were miraculous destructive forces that we all know. But the question is, you need more? One of what? What? Oh, I think also uh, here. No. This is last week. What? Never mind. I should never mind. Okay, I'll never mind. <laughs> okay, so Hashem could have just given made one major plague and then the whole story. And he hardened the heart of power. He wanted Paro to be taught a lesson and the Egyptians to be taught a lesson, but he also wanted to teach us a lesson. Oh, I can start. So last week we started the Sikha of Akutachin. I'm going to get there, but I want to go through the 10 plague therapy first. 10 plague therapy, Malka. 10 plague therapy, Malka. Thanks, Rahul. Unforgettable, Malka. 10 plague therapy. Okay, so it's an educational experience. They weren't simply a punishment for Paro, they were actually lessons for us how to get closer to the SRS Hadibri. I'm repeating what I said before because everyone was here. In other words, 10, why 10, not 9, not 11? Because there are 10 commandments and the Jews had to become aligned and spiritually oriented to receive the 10 commandments, the SRS Hadibri, with all of our 10 faculties of our soul, Chabad, Chagas, Nehim, you know, learn that in the cities. Um, the world also has 10 utterances. So to get the world aligned with Torah and the, our own little world, which is composed of 10, right? With the Aserahs and Dibrois, we needed 10 plagues. There weren't only plagues to punish the Egyptians. They were to teach us, teach us lessons, how to get rid of all our impediments, all our obstacles towards receiving the Torah. But number one, blood, the plague of blood. Okay, the plague of blood, we're going to chip away, chip away on the gross, vulgar world uh, to be able to be more receptive and more refined. We've got to start with something. So the first thing we've got to be told is that the water of the Nile, which is the fallacious belief of the Egyptians, was transformed into blood. What does that signify? It signifies stop believing in false icons. In modern society, we don't have idolatry, you know, we don't bow to idols, he say, but we also have idols. You know what they are? <laughs> you know what some of the idols are? It's pretty serious. Power, fame, entertainment, sometimes. Money, money especially. Money, power, having control, controlling people. These are icons that we sometimes can't break away from. We don't pull them, we don't pray to them, but we depend on them. And when our dreams and aspirations don't become, are not fulfilled, are not materialized, and they're elusive, you get depressed. And all sorts of negative consequences arise from our depression, from not getting what we're looking for. We can't live without social, without you know, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to get into the details. You all know what I'm talking about. We're not saying it shouldn't be used, but don't become consumed. Don't let it overtake you completely where you can't live your life without it. That's the idolatry of today. So it doesn't mean wealth is bad and everyone who is affluent suffers from depression. It does suggest that people who glorify money and their ultimate dream uh, is an delusion. They will prove painful. It'll, it'll, prove, it'll prove very painful at the end. You become very vulnerable, too vulnerable when you worship these icons. So the first step is stop believing in them. Stop believing in this president or this party or this, that. You're not, you don't pay allegiance to them. You have to respect them. President, you respect. So that was very much against disrespecting any president, by the way, even the ones that were not good for the Jews or for good for the country. After they left office even, I remember the Rebbe spoke much, I mentioned the name of the president years many years ago, the Rebbe mentioned, I don't like to hear negative things about any president. I'm talking about not evil people like, you know, the Hitler or the Stalin, you know, group. Oh my God, you're not very 
loving towards Israel or towards him or not good to the United States either. And the Rebbe was careful not to say one bad word. He even mentioned that this president prevented a third world war. And that was what? This president prevented a third world war. So you have to have respect. You're in this country, you gotta have respect. They're always respected. They always call this country a country of benevolent country, a Malka Shokhasset. But on the other hand, don't start feeling that this is my source of life. I can't live without it. I must have politics. I gotta talk about it 24 seven or, uh, or six. And then uh, entertainment and power and money and all that, we get caught into it. That's the idolatry of today. Stop it. So then we go to the next step. The 10 commandments, which commandment fits? We're gonna go in order. The first commandment fits with the first plague. It negates the first plague. I am God, your God. I'm very much yours. You belong to me. Pledge your allegiance to me, not to all these things that I've created. They're just tools. Use it as a tool to serve me, but don't get caught up with it. I am God, your God. Furthermore, we all know that the plague of blood came as a result. What did the Egyptians do to us? They deserved for the waters to be turned into blood. They stopped Jewish women going to the mikvah. They did not allow mikvah immersion. What's mikvah immersion mean? The word tibila has the same letters as habitual, nullification. Totally immersed. If one hair is sticking out, it invalidates the entire tibila, mikvah. Totally immersed in the waters of Torah. Torah, water is a metaphor for Torah. Blood is the passion for all the other things that we have. <clears throat> So we have to make sure that we are aligned completely submerged into the waters of Torah. And that will get rid of the other waters and mess up the whole Nile. Nile River was water and they worship the Nile. So that's the idolatry of them. It also corresponds to the Esospheros backwards. The first plague is Malchus. <laughs> Malchus, who runs the world? God. Okay. I'm going to go quickly. There's much more to it than that. It also connects with Mashiach. I'm going to skip that part and go to the second plague. So we already understand, logically, rationally, we are convinced, you're right. All these icons are not what gives us our life. Yeah, we have a problem. You know, we're addicted to it, but we're not really, we don't really believe in it logically, rationally, cognitively speaking. When we use our brains, we realize it's the wrong thing, but we just can't help ourselves. So it's not good enough. What do we need? If you get emotionally tied to something, you get an addiction, you have to have a reverse experience. Like a person into drugs, deep into drugs, the only way you can get out of it is by having a terrible experience where you hit rock bottom. And when you hit rock bottom and you get a very disturbing, a horrible experience from what you've been taking, that can get you out of it. Logic doesn't work. When you're addicted emotionally, when your emotions are tied to something, logic won't help. You're not interested. You, you can't get that, just the, the, the uh, you know, the, ties to the icons you were in, you can't get that out of your system. You need to have a reverse emotion. So what came out of the Nile in the second, the second plague? Frogs, and they were disgusting. The Nile River was the only part of the water, according to many, if they wanted water, they can get water by digging. It was the Nile was the one, was the water they was affected. Okay, but they didn't have frogs croaking all over them and going into their mouths on their beds and making noise that that you, you got you went deaf. You can hear anything, you can hear yourself talk. It drove them crazy. It became repulsive, disgusting, hard to imagine it. <laughs> so where the Niles come? Where, where do the frogs come from? From the Nile. In other words, the Nile is, is causing, is the source of something that is abhorrent, repulsive, disgusting, something that your emotions can't tolerate. We're having now a reverse experience. Now the icons become the source of disgust. That's how we can solve the second impediment. I understand God is the boss, but I just don't feel like changing. Yeah, when you'll have a reverse emotion, when you'll see how disgusting uh, those sources can be, like a hijack, hijack the uh, uh, person who's hijacked, you have the um, captives feel like, oh, you know, we need them. We understand they're evil people, but we need them right now. And then when they do something horrible to you, then you begin to realize people we're depending on are sick. And then that takes you away from starting to depend on them. It's the, um, yeah. 
So philosophy is not always enough. Sometimes we need to have much more than philosophy. We need to have a reverse emotional experience. And that will wipe away the other experience that's emotional. That's your addiction. Um, so when we reflect on the repulsive nature of some of the things to which we become so strongly attached, we come one step closer to rejecting all these icons and getting closer to healing without feeling, without feeling the stifling and debilitating effects of these fads and icons. Now we are free to advance. Now we can start. And once we've gotten rid of all these things that are disturbances in our, in our service to Hashem, now we can start the positive relationship. Now it's interesting. The second commandment is pretty much like the first commandment. What's the second commandment? Let you not have other gods. Here we're focusing on the negative. First one is just speaking about gods being the boss, but doesn't discuss idol, idolatry explicitly, but implicitly. And it doesn't make fun of the idols. What do you mean other gods? Let you not have other gods? There are no other gods. Why is Hashem saying don't have other gods? What does Rashi say? Don't have those false gods who act as aliens to you. When you pray to them, they don't answer you. They're dead. They don't respond. They don't really help you in your, in your life. They act as strangers to you. They act as if you are someone else, others. So the Torah is actually in the second commandment belittling idolatry and making it disgusting by believing it. You, you believe in all that garbage and all that falsehood? I know there are a lot of Rabbi Tuvia Singer who works for the Jews for Judaism ridicules. So did Emmanuel Shochet passed away not too long ago. Uh, went through the, he knew the whole new style, the new, I won't mention the name, the new, you know what, and he knew it were verse for verse, every single verse backwards. And he was able to mamish, make the whole thing sound like a horrible uh, play of trying to fool people. And you get repulsed from here when you hear that. I don't want to be a victim of falsehood. So the second commandment corresponds to the second, the second uh, plague. What sphero is it? You sowed. What is you sowed? We're going up now, up the ladder. Malchus, Yesod, Hod, Netzach, Beres, Gura, Chesed, Das, Bina, Chachma. Yesod is exactly the problem that this person is having. The person who only knows that God is right but can't feel it, doesn't have any of the courage to break away from all the things they, that, that became habitual, that person has a problem with Yesod. Yesod means when you have a strong addiction to something and you're tied very much to something that you can't help the thoughts you can't control your thoughts you can't control, you're beyond control you're attached and you can't get out of it that's the assault. so the second play corresponds to correcting the assault instead of being a tide addicted to who knows what get addicted to godliness let that become the center of your life i just heard i just heard last night from rabbi yy jacobson he quoted from another rabbi, Rabbi Greenglass, who is the um, Kubel, New Kabbalah, he was a pretty holy man, passed away about 11 years ago in Montreal, Canada. And he said he heard this vort, very interesting passage from Matilin. Matilin says, L'chala Yom, chapter 84, I think, no, chapter 104, to you is day, L'cha, to you, God, the day belongs to you, Aflacha, and also to you is night. What is that supposed to mean? It sounds like God is control of day and night. Okay. So even night, the dark things, God is also in control, just as he's in control when you see the light. But he explained it differently. Lecha, yom, stop. If you are pledge your allegiance just to God and to nothing else, you think about him a lot, he's the center of your life, then your light, your life will be day. It'll be bright and radiant. Lecha, if it's to you and only to you, hayom. Af lecha. But if God is also something to think about, but not the center, you know, every once in a while you have a holiday, so you think about the mitzvah, yeah? but then the rest of the year you're totally out of it. When someone asks you, how are you? What do you answer? I'm good. Where's the Baruch Hashem? Uh, that's nerdy. Baruch Hashem, you know, come on. What, what's, what's your problem? These are from people. That I hear, I was born with an instinct. It came out of my mouth without thinking. I couldn't say, I'm good. I used to laugh when I heard non Jews answering, I'm good. What do you mean you're good? You mean Baruch Hashem? And now the guy in Albany Bakery, the uh, 
Spanish guy, I always says, thank God. He even says Baruch Hashem in Hebrew also. I got him to say Baruch Hashem, thank God. And he doesn't think it's a joke. He likes it. In other words, if Hashem is the center of your life, you pledge your allegiance to him, l'cha, only to you, hayom. Af l'cha, if it's also to Hashem, but not exclusively to Hashem, you could have dark moments in your life. Because you start blaming things you don't believe, well, some talk to the Sikha, you talk and you start blaming this, why is this happening? It should not have happened. And you get devastated, why is all this happening to me? And you can't take it. But if you put your full trust in Hashem, Lecha and only Lecha, then Hanya. Anyway, so I wanted to mention that likewise over here, getting rid of the idolatry completely, both intellectually and also emotionally, you need the first two plagues. Okay, now we can start our service. Proceed towards the Sarah The third plague. What was the third plague? Lice. What was the interesting part of not lice? That the Egyptians couldn't, they couldn't, um, they couldn't do it. They just couldn't um, replicate what Moshe Rabbeinu did. Why? Okay. Why? Why? <laughs> Why? Because it was too small, too petty. You know, magic doesn't deal with things that are so petty. Come on, yeah. We don't deal with such little unimportant things in our lives. Yeah. Well, Hashem doesn't believe in that. Little things aren't so little. Little things could be a lot bigger than you think, maybe even bigger than the big things. Little things are very important in life. Most of our life is covered with little things, right? Major things don't happen so often in life. The little things must be important. They cover most of our day and our life. So the third plague to play this Egyptian perspective, this Goethe perspective, big things, yeah, small things. So if some Jews feel they're goal-oriented, too much goal-oriented. If I don't reach my goal, it's either all or nothing. I can't take these incremental steps. It's the baby steps. They're meaningless. They get me nowhere. I have to do it all. I got to conquer and become the, and change the whole crown heights, change everyone. I have to work on myself, I just my family, that's boring. I need to become a whole leader. And you feel you can't accomplish everything, you don't want to even start. You stop believing in the incremental steps in the small little features called lice. So the third plague is get rid of that notion that small things are small. Because if you still have that notion, you're never going to be able to want to believe that you can ever accomplish something in life. And you can't proceed to the giving of the Torah and to accept the Ten Commandments. So I want to mention here something interesting. Oh, by the way, they said, what was the reason for the frogs? I got going back for a second. Why did Hashem bring the frogs as a punishment? Because the Egyptians did not want to feel, did not want us to feel accomplished. Because sometimes when you do something, even though you're being forced, at least I accomplished something. I built a building, you know, we finally did it. Worked so hard, finally did it. They wanted us to suffer. They put all kinds of horrible, disgusting, rodents and insects all over the place, so we should not be able to tolerate one moment of what we're doing. So Hashem said, I will pay you back with making your life disgusting too. The third is the, the lice. And that corresponds to the third commandment. What's the third commandment? Going once, third commandment. <laughs> Who knows? Do not mention my name in vain. Don't swear and use my name. Don't play around with my name. Can we soon connect that to the third plague? And usually when you say we think, oh, it's not a big deal, we're just saying. So exactly. Wow. Exactly what I'm trying to. Wow. Well, wow. Thank you. We'll get there in a second. I think we're wrong. You want to change seats? All right. Let's go. <laughs> not yet. See you in my Okay. Um, so let me show you. Nothing is trivial. I'll show you. I'll show you a story before I get to the. My niece, my great niece, no, my niece, when she was not even three years old, she forgot a terrible thing happened in her life. Now, please sit, sit, sit down and, and make sure you don't get, oh, that's so terrible. She forgot to light the Shabbos candles. Tragedy, right? A two and a half year old girl forgot to light the Shabbos candles. Oh, wow, that's scary. I must be shaking. The Rebbe in the month of Elul did not respond to major medical issues. Whether a person would have a surgery, emergency surgery or not, but that wasn't responding. That was too busy with the new with, the, with, with Rosh Hashanah. Couldn't talk, can't get anything out of the Rebbe. Someone decided, the father of this girl decided to ask the Rebbe 
Maybe there's something I can do to my young, young little daughter who failed to light the candle by mistake last week, a terrible crime. Is there anything we can do next week? Within five minutes, an answer came out of the Rebbe's room. Let her add one penny next week. She can't light a second candle because girls don't light more than one. So let her add one penny to her tzedakah next week before she lights the candles. Did I have to take out everything, stop whatever he was doing? <laughs> Tell a child. And what would have happened if she wouldn't give that one penny next week? Would the world come to an end? I don't think so. For the Rebbe, tzaddikim are like God also. They are like Hashem. They feel the importance of every tiny little so-called trivial thing in life. And they make it, and for them it's big. The other story is the story in Chumash with Yosef. Yosef in prison. How did he become a viceroy? He asked that, why are you so sad? As if it's a question, why are prisoners sad? You know? And he has no sadness in his life. He only lost his mother, sold by his brothers, hated by everyone, put into prison for who knows how many years, accused of doing something he never did. And he's asking, why are you sad? But you know what that did? They told him their dreams. We had a dream, we can't interpret it. And the rest is history. He became a viceroy. He saved the country, he saved the world. From one little gesture, how are you? You can save the world. Don't underestimate the value of a smile to a person in the morning. And even to a non-Jew, you never know that non-Jew, the stories that non-Jew, that non-Jew that you helped out financially, and you thought, what do I have to help this guy out? It's not a very good guy anyways. And the story goes, that guy became later on in, in his life a judge. And then when you were accused falsely of doing something, and they brought, brought you to the court, to the, you know, in the USSR, Soviet courts, and not so, uh, and this judge was the judge to judge your case. He saw you, he remembered you, and he, and, he, and he gave you any, that was the end. He, you were vindicated. The third commandment is don't take, I believe in God. You think God cares about the little thing of a mention of his name? He's not like, you know, a person who's like, sound sensitive. We're sensitive. Our name is used in vain. God is so great. You think he cares about the fact that we mentioned his name? On the contrary. Mention his name and we're showing respect to him. No, 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 no. You are not understanding the value of small things. Like people say, does God really care how I dress or how I eat? I think he really cares about that. He's watching you. So that's the problem. That's the problem. That's the third command, the third plague. It plagues us. And the, what is the third sphere going up the ladder? Hode. What is hode? Gratitude. Submission. Don't underestimate the value of, I'll answer in a second, no. the value of, yeah. sorry, sorry. okay, no, sorry. <laughs> I'll answer you. The value of showing, saying a thank you, no matter how small the favor was, thank you so much. Thank people. Be submissive. Allow yourself to respect another person who did you a small favor. Don't underestimate the value of good. The value of, a, in other words, be grateful for every little thing. That's hode. Hode means to be mode, to thank, to admit when you're wrong. You know, it's not, it's not a big deal. If you made a mistake, admit you were wrong. I know it's a little bit of submission, you know, do so. Give yourself up and thank another person. I know it doesn't feel good to be indebted. I got a favor from this person. Well, I received a favor. It doesn't, I, feel, I don't feel comfortable. I, I borrowed and that person. It doesn't feel good to know that you have to come on to other people, but don't put that, don't put that, uh, put that away as something small. It's very, very important. So that would be the hode. Then we have the fourth plague. I mean, there's a lot more to the plagues I'm not mentioning. The fourth plague is plague of mixture of wild animals. And the first time the Chumash mentions that it did not affect the Jewish people. The other three, some say affected the Jews also. Even the commentaries, the commentators who say it did not affect the Jewish people, but there's no mention in the Chumash that it did affect the Jewish people. The first plague where it says clearly that we weren't affected is plague four. Of all the plagues you would think, that we would be affected. Why? Mixture of wild animals, everything's mixed. Animals that never see each other are mixing. So let's mix Jews with non-Jews. Let's, we're all the same in the same boat. And yet, the fourth commandment is another interesting commandment. It tells us, and it corresponds to Shabbos, as we'll see, that sometimes people have the opposite problems that they only believe they can do small things and they don't believe they really can make big things happen. The opposite problem. 
I'll read a few. Words are very powerful. The, the words of the fourth plague. It's an opposite challenge of the preceding. There it was explained that fear is that we will dismiss the baby steps and small gestures. In this fourth step of our template therapy, the emphasis is on dispelling the notion that we are small people and can only do small things that we can never truly achieve distinction and greatness. We're not special. Yeah? You, don't, you have a copy? Yeah. Oh, you have a copy. Uh, yeah, it's not there. This is this is uh, something else. It's not a season. <laughs> I'm cheating. I, I might get thrown out of here if I find, if they find out that I'm teaching something that's not a season. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, so we're gonna put some finish. So having rejected false ide ideals, both intellectually and emotionally, and gained appreciation for the small little steps we take in our lives, we can encounter one more formidable obstacle to growth. We cannot see our own uniqueness. We undersell ourselves and feel that we cannot really, we're just like, we're not really special. Being a Jew doesn't make you feel special. You don't like to hear you're the chosen people. You want to be like, no, don't say that so loud. You don't want to feel you're different and that we're divine. We have a chedek of the mal, part of God in us, and that we can change the world. I don't believe that. I, and that's the problem the Jews have also. It's the opposite problem of the previous plague. This corresponds to Shabbos. On Shabbos, Shabbos is a day where a Jew has to work, has to rest, and a non-Jew has to work. Look at the difference. We make Havdalah. What do we say at Havdalah? Hamavdil ben Yisrael lo'amim. He who separates the Jewish world from the non-Jewish world. So Shabbos is a unique proof that we are different. We are, we're not the same. You have a whole different shlichos in life. And what they are not allowed to do, we must do. And after Shabbos, we reiterate, Shabbos is leaving with us, but it tells us that we are so different from the rest of the world. And it should be also spelled out of Moshe Shabbos. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that way. They go, what they, what they do Moshe Shabbos? What do they do when it's not Moshe Shabbos? Saturday night is not a very holy night in the, in the greatest world. A lot of things that are not so kosher. It's when you get completely wild. And by us, I'm a lava malka. We're escorting the queen, the Shabbos queen. Don't have to go to a pizza shop. It's not one of the, it's not the 11th commandment. You're allowed to sit in your house, even though it's, you're allowed to actually sit home and enjoy the aftermath of the Shabbos and have a meal and sit and tell stories, any stories, and get warmed up with the Shabbos atmosphere to keep, keep you going for the rest of the week. It's a Jewish way of looking at it. So we have a whole Jewish perspective, very different from the non-Jewish world, what we do on after, after Shabbos. Shabbos, we're in Gan Eden. Seems like we love to kick ourselves out of Ghana as soon as possible. I'll, when when Shabbos over? Five minutes? Okay. So boring in the summer. Oh, I can't I'm sleep. No. That's, that's horrible. Shabbos could be the most exciting day of the week if you actually tune into it. And the fact we can't do any work is because we're getting involved in something much greater than what we do during the six days. Netzach. What's Netzach? Victory, being victorious, prevailing over all obstacles. Like singing the song of victory before you even go out to war. We won. Dida Natsach. Natsach means prevailing, being victorious, being triumphant. Winning, having a winning attitude. Optimism, because of knowing who you are and knowing that Hashem is on your side. He says to you on when you go out to war, you're going on your enemy, not towards your enemy. You're above the enemy. It's a war fought from on high. That's Netzach. The fifth commandment is the animals are different. The wild animals, not the wild, all the animals were plagued. They died, the Egyptian animals, and the Jewish animals were saved. So in short, I'm going to go quick. This shows that even not only our nephilim makes us different, we have a godly soul, non-Jews don't have a godly soul, but even from our animals, animal soul's perspective, our animals are holy relative to the rest of the world. We have the ability to take some of the traits that our animal soul has and to separate it and use the good. Jealousy can be used for the good. Passion that the animal soul has can be used for, for good things. So a lot of the animal traits that, that, the, uh, that our, that our Nebuchadnezzar Bahamas has can be utilized for good. It doesn't have to be a dichotomy between our godly soul and the animal soul. 
we can bind them together and make a beautiful mosaic between the two, Tiferes. That's Tiferes. The idea of being able to connect the two together. And which co uh, commandment corresponds to that? Honoring your father and mother. Honoring parents. Is that a man to God or a man to man? It's a man to man, to your parents, your humans. Yet it's put in the first five commandments. The fifth commandment is honor your parents. It goes with all the other commandments. Shop is it's interesting. We think it belongs in the second half, which is man to man, person to person. But here we see that we can actually connect a man to man relationship, person to person relationship, and parents treating your parents properly, just so normal. They brought you into this world and they took care of you. It's only natural, even if your animal soul should agree that they should be listened to and respected and not insulted. And that's tantamount to respecting God. It says, if you respect your parents, like you, it's like you brought the Shekhinah into your home. That's what it says, the mother says that. Introduced me into your dwelling place. So we see a, a synthesis between man-to-man -man laws and man-to-God laws, the idea of Tiferes, fifth commandment. Okay, the rest of the commandments are very tough to explain. My brother has all the, ever, all the 10 as well, but I'm just going to, after this class, give you, give out, I only have six or five, five or six. Yeah, in this book. So the, actually the book is in the library, I think we're in the library here, it's on Pesach. Huh? Fancy. Yeah. I said it's fancy. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, now back to the Sikha. So we spoke last week, let me just go with summary we did in the Sikha last week quickly. I want to try to finish it. I don't know how we're going to do it, but I, I spent so much time on this, but we'll try to finish it. Um, we talked about, we talked, and we mentioned the Pesach and Chumash when Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw the Egyptian, uh, the two Jews fighting, and he told one, this one Jew, why are, you, why are you fighting with your brother? Why are you about to hit your brother? And what did they answer? Uh, are you going to kill us like you killed the mystery? Uh-oh. So Meshach said, Meshach got afraid, and he said, looks like what I did is known. So Rashi says that. Then he gives another shot. And this is seemingly a very difficult shot. And in the, yet Rashi uses the second shot, and that is, no, he wasn't afraid of what's going to happen to him, of being caught. He was afraid of the Jewish people never being redeemed. And when it says, ah, alas, indeed, the matter is known. What, what matter is he talking about? Not the matter of my killing the ministry, but the matter of, I always wondered why did the Egyptians, why were, why were Jews suffering so much all these years? What did we do to suffer so much? Now I can see why. Because we have informers, tale bearers, who inform people. That's why Jews suffer. Because he saw from their threat that they're going to tell, inform Paro. That Moshe killed the mystery. So he said, hey, tell me is here. Now I understand. Achain, alas, indeed, no dahadovo, the matter as to why, so why the Jews had to suffer so long for so, so much time and so harshly. Now I understand. So the Rebbe asked, what's wrong with the first shot? It sounds so simple, so straightforward. Why did he bring the second shot? Which is very problematic. How could Moshe Rabbeinu say that God won't bring the Gugula? Didn't Hashem promise of Ramavinu? How could he question and think, who knows? Maybe they won't, they'll never be redeemed. So there are a lot of questions. There are answers to the questions, but there are a lot of questions. Why, why get involved? Suffice with a simple shot. Moshe was afraid that he will be caught, and he verbalized, oh, hey, indeed, the matter has been known, that I killed the mystery, I'm in trouble. What's wrong with that shot? So the Rebbe answers based on the idea of Bitochem. So he went through a good part of a sikha, not a good part, but a, a few pages of a sikha. Let's now continue. And I'll tell you exactly where we're up to. And we're going to go fast. Um, it's the first secret, volume 36. And we're up to. Yeah. A rationale for equanimity. What's this idea? Why should I trust that Hashem will, you know, be good to me? After all, Hashem punishes people when they deserve it. So what's the basis of my belief that he will be good to me? So the Rebbe answers, gives an answer which he doesn't like. This is the passive understanding, the traditional understanding of Bitochen, which is wrong. It's a very important feeling to have, but it's not what Bitochen really is. And that is, equanimity is, I'm calm. Hashem is the boss. If I am to be saved, even though it doesn't seem like there's any room for me to have salvation, Hashem will certainly, he's, he's certainly right, righteous, he will certainly save me. How? I don't know, none of my business. I trust that he will do what's right. And if I'm not going to be saved, I'm not going to, he's not, I'm going to be punished, I'm going to suffer. 
So be it. I'm in his hands. I don't attribute my suffering to anything outside of God. I'm not afraid of the weather conditions. I'm not afraid of people. I'm afraid of Hashem. So I'm calm. I can trust him. You know, he created me. He knows me better than I know myself. Whatever he does, I'm good. I'm game. I'm calm. It's equanimity. And it's probably for my good also. God is good. So if I'm sure it's for my good. I accept it peacefully. Not easy to have that feeling. But it goes, Bitochen goes much further. That's called passive Bitochen. Sit back and whatever Hashem does, of course, you got to pray, daven, but if I already daven, I did everything I can. Now I trust that he will, whatever he will do, it's his business. None of my business to have any thoughts about him, of questioning him or questioning anything. It's all, it's all, it's all good. Says the Rebbe, that's not, if you look into the actual uh, sources of Chovas Halavavos, which is the uh, safer that the Sikha is based on a lot, from Rabbeinu Bechaye, who lived many hundreds of years ago before Bilal Shem Tif. He says that that's not what Bitochen is. And so many others also follow his. Bitochen is not a passive, it's proactive. And it's not based on a Muno. Because it's no big deal. It's not a big deal. I mean, for, if you believe in God, you believe he's good, you believe he's in control. So part of belief, now according to the first shot we just said, the first traditional understanding of Bitochen, What's the big novelty? It's understandable. If you believe in God, you have to believe that he's good, knows what he's doing, means for your better, for, for, for your advantage. So it's only concluded. If you believe God is not fair, then it's not a God. <laughs> if you believe in God, but he's not fair, then you don't believe in God. Because God spells out G-D, good. By definition, he's the <laughs> ultimate good. So that's not a chiddish. It's a part, that's part of part of Amuna. You know what Bitochen is? Not that I believe that God is, uh, is, is in control and he's good and that, but I have now brought myself up to the level where I don't see, there's nothing, there's no statistics that will ever give me a reason to believe that I can be saved, but Hashem is omnipotent. And I trust not that he will give me the ultimate good, which is good for me, but not good now. He will give me the exact good that I'm, that I'm asking for, that I'm wishing for. The revealed good, manifest good. Not the good that he perceives, but the good that I want. And the question is, but wait a second, then how will Hashem ever punish a person? I mean, what do you mean? That if you did sin and you deserve punishment and, you, and suddenly you still say to yourself, I'm sure that I will get exactly what I want. Why am I sure? Not because I've had experience or I saw another person going through what I went through and somehow he got out of it. There is no thin thread to hold on to. Nothing in nature will give you the reason to believe that you have a chance to get out of this predicament. I don't believe in anything. The only thing that exists in my life is God himself. Wow. So you've, got, you've taken yourself out of the limits of nature completely. You broke through all the barriers. The only thing that exists is God himself. So God says, uh-huh, I will reciprocate, measure for measure. Just as you went out of your boundaries, out of your measurements, out of the rules of nature, you didn't believe in anything but me, I will reciprocate. What am I going to do? I am going to go also beyond my borders, which has rules. If you sin, you get punished. That's a rule. But I will transcend every rule and regulation. All calculations are not to be used anymore. You've reached me where I am above calculations. Because you went out of your, your limits, I will go out of my limits. God's limits are the Torah. The Torah says, if you do this, you get this punishment. But because you put your complete faith, and not just faith, but trust, and you actually felt it, not that in the heart, it was just a, you know, a lip service, but in the heart, now maybe some people say, I haven't talked, I never told anyone, I, I kept in, my, in myself. I was really scared. I, I'll tell you a story of my father. My father was one of the was born, born in Brooklyn, American born, Yankee. And he was sent by the, by the previous Rebbe to build a yeshiva in Atwatsk in Poland in the 19, right before the world, the Second World War. In El time, when war broke out Mamish a couple weeks after he arrived. And um, he had a shlichus. On the way there, he was stopped off in France. 
The Rebbe was in France, our Rebbe. The Rebbe gave him drugs for the previous Rebbe's health. Medicines. And my father had to put it into his suitcase and smuggle it across the border. Not eat. And in the German border. The Germans were not our friends in those days. Right? This is already after Kristallnacht. 1939. And my father's was caught. Effentauf. Effentauf. Open up the suitcase. A uh, miracle could have happened. They wouldn't. They wouldn't even ask him to open it up. They opened it up. <laughs> they, put, they picked up the, the, the drugs. What's it us? In a very accusatory, "You're in trouble." My father said, not being nervous, because he knew he's a shliach of one rebbe for another rebbe, sandwiched in between two rebbes. <laughs> My father said, "Das is garnished," like all smiling. "Das is garnished." It's nothing. That's a garnish? Yeah. Back off. Close the suitcase. Goodbye. <laughs> like a pillow story. Makes sense? No. <clears throat> but he has a strong be talking. There is no world. There are no rules yet. It doesn't exist. There never exists. I'm just doing the shlichus. That's all. Interesting story. So be talking is not just you don't verbalize it, but in your heart, I'm very, very worried. I just I have to be careful to say it. I don't want to move, make other people scared, so I have to keep it in my heart. <laughs> you have to feel it's going to be good. That's my father had a, you know, a reason. He was, maybe he was relying on the fact that he was the Rebbe Shlia, so it made it a little easier. But even if you're not, even if you're not doing such a holy uh, you know, thing of carrying something that would be a uh, refuel for a Rebbe, you're doing going about your life and you're in trouble right now and things aren't going well. You have to have a but you have to really believe in it. You have to really feel there's nothing in this world. I don't need to have any statistics. I don't need to have anything. I'm sick. It will be good. His, his compassion, his benevolence is unlimited. And you're feeling that connection to him. You feel this kinship with Hashem. Like So then you go away from all the limits of life and Hashem responds equally. He also takes away all the borders, all the barriers. With one condition, you can't rebel against him while you're trusting him. You can't say, you know, well, trust. He doesn't care about any, he's beyond limits, so I will therefore take off my yarmulke or just do something on Shabbos or eat a, an unkosher sandwich while I'm trusting in God. That doesn't work. Because then if you're doing rebelling against God, you can't be trusting. Trusting and rebelling. What it does mean is that your past sins, maybe, you have not done full tshuva yet. It's hard sometimes to really read remorse, but right now you're in the motion of connection to Hashem. Someone asked me in the class last year, so why do we have to daven for? Well, we asked the question, does that mean I should not, I should rely on miracles and not do anything according to the rules of nature? No, no, no. Talk doesn't mean that you should do things according to, not, to the rules of nature. Do it. But after you've done everything, you've exhausted all the rules of nature, and why am I doing it? Not because... I believe in nature because God wants me to do it. Hashem, for whatever reason, wants me to do things according to nature. If I did and still am in trouble, it's not working, now is the time to rely on miracles because you have no other choice. So just like we do things according to nature, you could say that davening is also one of the things he wants you to do. He wants you to daven to Hashem, daven to him. He wants to hear your prayers. That's one answer, possibly. It's part of a mechanism of al Teva. For a Jew, davening to Hashem is natural, a natural means of getting help. But it could also be something else. Part of your davening could be, I'm davening that I should have bitachin. Thirdly, davening doesn't mean you're asking, you're begging for Hashem only. It means you're connecting to Hashem. The davening is the same, one of the same with the bitachin. You're connecting to get to that level which allows you to have bitachin. Your davening is giving you the fuel to be able to have this feeling that there's nothing else but God. So it's not a contradiction. Now, what's not in the Sikha here, which I'll add, I know you want to learn inside, but <laughs> is from another Sikha, where the Rebbe says the following, a higher level of Bitochna, even when things are going right for you, you have the food on the table, everything is smooth in life. You feel the same way in trusting Hashem as you feel when you have no choice but to trust Him. If you only trust in Him when you have no choice, Something's really limited with your trust. 
The way one can have a full trust in Hashem, when even when things are normal, everything is fit, everything you have, everything on your table. There's the Zohar. Now let me. Um, the Zohar tells a story to the rabbi. In fact, we're here. Uh, it's a copy from Chobos Halavavos. In pr- truth, the person must reach the ultimate level of trust even when he has a natural way of survival. Even if a person has a flourishing job and a good channel for livelihood, he nonetheless must place his full faith in God, not believe in the laws of nature. Believe, have the same level of I trust in God just as when you have to trust. In other words, it's a miracle that here's what the Gemara says here that a person plants a seed and puts his trust in God that it will grow. What do you mean trust in God? It grows. It's nature. We all know when you put a seed in the ground, it's going to grow. I believe so because I trust in God, not because I trust in nature. I'm so much in touch with Hashem that every part of my life is an, 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 uh, an experience of emunah. Often, we only have to use emuna when we have no choice. A true trustworthy pers- person who really puts his full trust in Hashem is everything is from him. So just like when the man came down from heaven, you knew it was from God, you feel the same way, the need to put your trust in Hashem even for things that are natural. And I'll share with you one more thing. Sometimes we can have a conflict. We believe Hashem is who put nature into, into effect. But sometimes we can have a, a, a issue, uh, a conflict. For example, if I daven, I know men have this more, if I daven long, I'm going to lose a very great opportunity. I'm going to be late for work. Um, that's one example the Rebbe gives in a sikha. And thus, you have a whole conflict. What should I do? Even if you end up winning the, winning the battle, you end up davening, it was a battle. But if a person goes to work because Hashem wants, everything is commandment of God. So even when you're involved in work, you're also serving him. So one mitzvah can extinguish another mitzvah. How could I say to myself that I'm afraid to go ahead and daven for too long? I might come late to work. They're both. There's one, one does not contradict the other. There's no conflict because everything you're doing in the, role, in the realm of nature is only because God said so. You don't give any credence, any belief in the laws of nature per se. I believe that Hashem has said this and this and this. He wants me to uh, do things according to Tev, I will do so. But I don't put any credibility to the laws of nature. I don't start believing in it. That's the ultimate level of the topic. So let's, well, learn something inside. Let's get to the actual uh, gist of the sequel. Let's take a look at page 11. Page 11. The above questions can be asked, what I said outside about what we're talking really is, here's, here's where the Rebbe gets into it. For understand, and the question of how can you have talking? how is God to punish a person if one is told to have talking? That means you're believing that God will not punish you, then there's no punishment. But Hashem will never give punishment to people. So the above questions can be resolved in light of an adage of the Semach Tzedek, quoted frequently by my revered father-in-law, the Rebbe Rayatz. Someone has begged him to intercede in order to arouse heavenly mercies upon a person who was dangerously ill, right? What was the Semach Tzedek's answer? Trach gut vajain gut. Think positively and the outcome will be positive. What is that supposed to mean? It is apparent from the response of the Semach Tzedek that thinking positively, having talking, in other words, will in itself give rise to results that are visibly and manifestly good. The talking itself is what makes things happen. There is no basis to believe that things will go well just like that, but with the talking, as a reward for your talking, things will go well. This teaching may be explained as follows. The obligation of talking, which we are commanded to cultivate is not merely a component and a corollary of on one's faith, that everything is in Hashem's hands. He is compassionate and merciful. No, such an obligation would not need to be stated separately. Rather, the obligation of talking is an avoda of its own, a separate path of divine service that motivates a person to rely and depend on God alone to the extent that he casts his love entirely upon him, no partnerships, only Hashem. As it is written, cast your burden upon God, Hashem and depend on no other support in the world apart from Hashem. 
it could be that this is what the author of the Choma Falabobos, this is the Sefer that we just mentioned before, written by Rabbeinu Bechaye, had in mind when he wrote that a person's betachem should resemble that of a bondman, page 12, who is imprisoned in a dungeon, who is dependent on the authority of his master. That prisoner's trust is directed only towards his master, to whom he is subordinate, and no man other than he can harm him or help him. Okay, so it follows that our trust in God is such that our actual material situation is of no consequence. Even if it's impossible for a person to be saved, according to the natural order, he relies on God who is rest not restricted by nature at all. This itself is the foundation for a person's trust that Hashem will bestow visible and manifest good. Because you have gone out of your limits, Hashem will reciprocate, even if you're not worthy of this kindness as of now. Now, Let's go to page 13. When trust is lacking, now we have an answer to the question we asked before. We asked before a question, why did Rashi have to, have to uh, what was bothering Rashi? What was wrong with the first, first answer? And what bothered Rashi was, Moshe was afraid. Yeah, and did he run away? No, he didn't run away. When did he run away? When Paro found out. So why mention he was afraid? What kind of significance does he was afraid have in the narrative? It didn't trigger anything. The answer is it did. Moshe was lacking to be talking, and he's happy to let us know about that. We should learn a lesson not to, not to do what he did. He had fear in his heart that he will be caught, and therefore, power heard about it. Why did the Yishma power? Why was it that power heard about it? By Yira Moshe, and he even verbalized his fear. Uh oh, it has been known. That's what triggered Paro's hearing about it. Had Moshe not felt the fear, power would never have heard about it. So this is a lesson in Bitochen. By Yira Moshe, the reason why that Moshe Rabbeinu's fear is mentioned because it had consequences. Had he not had that fear, there would be no, no negative consequences. Take a look at the very end of the Sikho. On page one, on page 14. From all the last paragraph, from all the above, one can also derive a practical directive. When a person encounters obstacles and hindrances in his observance of the Torah and its mitzvot, he should realize that the elimination of those obstacles depends on him and on his conduct. If he has absolute trust that Hashem will help him and change the situation to the point that he is utterly at ease without any worry at all, his bitachin will bear fruit. At the same time, of course, he must also take whatever natural steps are dependent on him in order to remove those obstacles. We have been given a promise, think positively, and the outcome will be positive. You can rest assured that this will actually take place, that all the obstacles and hindrances will cease to exist, and things will be good for us in a real and practical sense with the kind of good that is overt and manifest even to the eyes of flesh in the here and now. Now, one thing I have to mention, I mentioned it last week. Sometimes you complain, why am I in traffic? I'm going to be late for work. Then 9-11 happens. There are a lot of other examples. You miss your flight, the flight goes down. Story with uh, Arik Sharon, who never saved his life. He was about to leave, but never said to wait, wait more. Don't take that flight. That flight crashed. So sometimes we don't know what revealed good is. Sometimes Hashem is saving you. That's again. So we're talking about when a good is really good. It's a good that is purely good, revealed good, with no consequences at all from that good. So we have to be talking that Hashem will give me that kind of good, not the good that I come in time to work, and then God forbid something terrible happens. That's the perceived good. We mean what is really good on the level, on the human level, Hashem will pay you. Not what you think is good, but what is really good, but really good on the revealed level, not really good in God's eyes, in your eyes. Okay? So once we ascend to God's world, by looking at him as if he's the only thing that exists, he says, thank you. I will act as the only thing that exists and no rules will get into my way. I will offer you um, a salvation that you never could have believed that could happen, but you put your trust in me. You felt relieved. Even your heart wasn't uh, scared. So you have a story with my brother on the JetBlue flight. I told the story. I'm not everyone heard. <laughs> JetBlue flight, you know the story? Yeah. No. I told it at home. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a good story. <laughs> Everyone know the story? No? 
he was on JetBlue flight and uh, it was an interesting flight. He met a, he sat down uh, to a college, college student who was not religious. And uh, what time is it now? Do we have time? He sat down and he had a nice conversation with this guy. At first, to, to break the conversation, to start the conversation, he uh, happened to have see that it said that the altitude of the plane is 613 feet off the ground. So my brother says, you know what 613 is? No. That's how many commandments the Torah has for the Jewish people. Now he got into the whole conversation about Judaism. And then it says the um, um, speed of the plane is 358 miles an hour. Oh, 358. You know what that means? No, Mashiach. And so I had a whole talk about Mashiach. And then my brother says, looks like we're going to have a very interesting flight. He didn't know how interesting it would be. Not long after the announcement is made from the pilot or the co-pilot that we have an issue with our with the wheels of the plane, they're not going into the fuselage and we can't land. We have a problem. And, uh, but we, you know, we'll, hopefully things will be okay. We'll check and see if it's uh, just a temporary issue or, or, or a real issue. But people already were a little scared. This guy is not, uh, nice. this college student is a little nervous. My brother is as calm as ever. And um, then it gets worse. The stewardess are, get, are, are running and they look nervous. When they look nervous, you know something's wrong. The pilot makes another announcement. Unfortunately, we are, we are in trouble. And he didn't say it in a very comforting way, promising way. And uh, looks like we might have to have a crash landing. And then he says, um, a few minutes later, uh, you should know it's the first time ever in my, hit, in my whole career that I've had this issue. Oh, thank you. Now I really feel comfortable. Uh, so everyone is nervous. People are crying. This guy is screaming. Finally, says, "My Israel, Shema Lekeno, Shema God." Not even religious, but he says, "My Israel." My brother says, "What do you think, My Israel?" For? That's what people before they die they say that. Like, We're gonna live. <laughs> he said those words. The guy looking at what? And the whole everyone's looking at him. This guy's normal. This guy's calm. Crazy. And the plane landed miraculously. A little smoke came out, and no, that was the end of it. A week, a year later, my brother was giving a, you know, a, a lecture, I, I know, like one of the winter lectures, you know, but in the, for the guys in Seagate. And the guy comes over to my brother with a full beard. Rabbi, you recognize me? No. Jet Blue flight? That's you? Yeah. I took a flight to, to, to Judaism. And you know why? Because of you. I saw how calm you were. Everyone else was so nervous, and you're the only person who was calm. It must be a trick. In order to be calm, you have to be religious. I became religious. I met this guy about right before COVID. I met him, and I asked him, can you uh, tell the story? I told the story. Is this, is this true, story is true? Exactly true. Can you come to my house because we have some guests and tell the story personally? And he said, I can't do it today. I'll do it next week. But never came next week. COVID broke out next week, <laughs> so I couldn't do it. Um, Guy with a full beard looks like a real, like you never would believe he was ever, you know, anywhere else but uh, in Chabad. Has five children. He's Baruch Hashem affluent, and he has all uh, you know, Gashmias and the Rochnias. Unbelievable story. My brother, you know, is calm. He told me, but he, he told me, you know, that he wasn't so calm. You know, he was quite humble. And I was kind of scared, but I kept it in. Probably wasn't. <laughs> I know him well. Probably he was able to control himself. Um, so the end of the sikha, um, another story, I'll tell you another story. <laughs> My brother, I was a kid and I was learning in school. I guess I never told before. I was learning in the Bavash Yeshiva as a kid, 11 year old. My brother was six years older than me. So he would walk all the way from, from 770 to Bedford Side, not the best neighborhood, at night to learn with me. When he gets, I get there, he tells me I had an interesting uh, experience in this walk. While I was walking, uh, there was a guy, uh, about six foot four, and he didn't look, he looked up to no good. It looks like he wanted to attack me. I was almost was sure. So I said, if I run away, I'm finished. So I'll do everything according to Teva. I trust in Hashem things will work out, but let me do something according to nature that maybe will help, help myself. My brother walked right towards him, which is strange, walking right towards your, uh, you know, a guy who was about to assault you. And he says, oh, hi, what do you think about the situation in the Middle East? <laughs> he walked away. <laughs> but he had full betoching. <laughs> he had to use, he had to use some kind of, you know, 
natural means, but then the rest is in Hashem's hands. And uh, you could ask, how come Rabashkin, for example, when Rabashkin was in prison, should know that as soon as the last resort, the last thing that he was waiting for, possibly to have to work, stop working, he got very happy. Now I can trust only in Hashem. He said he was dancing. When his lawyer said it, forget about it, there's no chance, no chance. That's when he danced. And a few weeks later, <laughs> he was notified uh, that he's a free man. Uh, it might take time. Maybe Hashem wants more from him because he's actually he was doing the psalm in prison up there. And he became a hero over there. People, Mamash, uh, you know, he was like the beacon of light in that dark place. He said, the reason why I had the power, I was never in jail. I was in a place called prison, but I was never there. I didn't feel like I was there. I was just, I was physically situated there, but I wasn't a prisoner. I was in prison, but not a prisoner. He stayed above it. And that's what gave him the strength because it's not normal for a prisoner to have that. It's betachin, and it worked. He says, you know, uh, Emuna, Aleph, Beis, betachin, Gimel, Gula. If you want to get redeemed, you got to start with Emuna first. But then the Emuna grows into betachin, full trust in Hashem. It will be good. And then, and he was a living example of how powerful we talking can be. So the Sikha ends, this last paragraph. Um, just as concerning the redemption, the last paragraph from Egypt, the sages teach by virtue of their trust, the people of Israel were redeemed from Egypt. So too, with regard to the redemption from this last exile, the Medrash says they are deserving of redemption in reward for their hope alone. May this be just hoping. And having the full trust is good enough. May this be fulfilled for us that by virtue of the Jewish people's trust in the promise from Hashem, that my deliverance of Mashiach is soon to come, will we merit that he will redeem us with true and ultimate redemption. May this be take place speedily and in our days. We say in the davening, Why should Mashiach come? Because we put our trust in you. That's the good reason. Not to be tzaddikim, but we trusted in you. Therefore, he should come fast. Okay. Viva, Rivka? Yes. Michal, I'm here. Maya, I'm here. They're over here. Rotem, I'm here. Rivka, Rachel, here. Sofa.